Okay, folks, welcome to the latest segment of Let's Fix ISOM number two. I'm calling this segment Flop Psychology because we are going to be dealing with the question of why did ISOM quit? What is the psychology behind his refusal to act as a superhero anymore? So, in order to get into that, we have to travel back into the past, years ago, to a comic book or cosplay convention in which there is debris strewn all over the floor. Looks like a madhouse in there. And uh, we have two kids who are in hiding, and they are found by Isom, who is rescuing them. And one of the kids says, who are you? Did you kill that thing? And he says, not exactly. Not exactly? I mean, did you even fight it? Did you even see it? What the heck does not exactly mean? Okay, well, whatever. Let's keep moving. You can call me Isom. The area is being secured and it's still a madhouse outside. I'm just here to save any stragglers. Well, that was the most chaotic thing I'd ever seen. I'm positive I saw that thing kill one of the officers. It happened so fast and then everything just stopped. The place cleared out in an instant, but we couldn't make it to the exit. I thought we for sure were left for dead. Well, I got here as fast as I could, but I assumed there was no way that everybody got out. Let's get you out of here, and I'll keep... dun dun dun, dun Run! And Chadron appears. Okay. Is anybody else seeing this? I mean, this is not exactly the uh, Chadron that I was expecting from the cover. The cover Chadron looks a hell of a lot scarier. This the, That Chadron looks like he's like part skull, part eels for hair, part like just living embodiment of death. And this Chadron looks more like a cross between Bob Marley and that nurse from the Twilight Zone. I mean, my God, throw some like Drax the Destroyer tattoos on him. And yeah, he's not even scary then because Drax is not exactly the scariest character in the Marvel Universe. So I, I don't know what the hell happened here. Moreover, if you look at his size, I mean, he's he's Santuan big, but he's not nearly as big as the character that's given to us by Turnian on cover A. I mean, that guy's about one and a half times Avery's size, and like I said, Shadron's only about Santuan size. That's not That's not really all that scary. Plus, if you look at um, the debris and the destruction, one of the things you, you don't see about Chadron's wiping out the Cosplay Center is any bodies. There's, there's no bodies strewn over the floor. And plus, the girl only mentions that she saw the thing kill one of the officers, and then everything just stopped, and then the place cleared out. Chadron's kill count is one? I mean, I, I'm, I'm just trying to figure out why is it I should be scared at this point. And then, moreover, we're given the name Shadron. Now, I know that sounds inconsistent for me to complain about Shadron's name being announced, given that I'm always getting on Eric July's case about the fact that he has a hard time naming his characters, or at least his, his uh, supporting characters. But in this case, Shadron's like an unknown quantity. Now, he's not like, say... Yaira in issue number one, or Alpha Core in issue number one, where their names are given there. And it's okay in their cases, I feel, because they're known quantities to everybody around except the reader. I mean, it's only the reader who's needing to be introduced, and so it's okay for the writer to stoop to this convention and introduce the characters by this direct messaging. But in the case of Shadron, he's supposed to represent the unknown. He's supposed to represent the chaotic unknown that Avery can't overcome. And if you name the unknown, that makes it just by itself a little less scary. So, huh, yeah. I mean, it would be one thing if Avery were to, to say something like, much later I learned that the creature's name was Shadron, because then you have the perspective of looking back on the past, but... If you're just going to announce the creature's name as if you were some sort of known quantity, that that's just weird. I, I don't understand why you would do that. So Chadron, instead of paying attention to Avery, looks at the kids who are running away and is kind of like, hmm, who do I go after? And Avery punches Chadron to get Chadron's attention. And this panel just cries out for dialogue. Eyes front! But... Avery's punch doesn't seem to make much of a dent, and Shadron's still looking at uh, the kids and thinking, eh, you know, I think I'm going to go after them instead. And so Shadron says to 
Avery Um, Umbalor. And now I'm like, okay, and now here's another reason not to consider Shadron all that scary, because now we don't actually know whether he's a malevolent figure or not. You know, if you've got, is he some kind of alien? Is he some kind of, like, underground dwelling species member? Is he just from another dimension? Um, I don't understand. The, the fact that he doesn't speak the same language of Avery means that he could just wind up being some kind of alien being or other species that has a different set of ethics and morals than we do. And so he may not actually be evil in a sense, even though that's what he's going to be represented as in the future. I mean, the Klingon society as it is, I mean, you can look at it and you can think it's evil compared to yours, but as far as a society with a value set of good and evil all its own, you might just be dealing with conflicting versions of morality. And that doesn't lead Chadron to be considered a evil character, but rather just somebody who is in a world that doesn't understand his particular value set. Oh, and by the way, it was I was today years old when I realized that the original Klingon makeup was essentially blackface. So now uh, Chadron takes off after the two kids and grabs the girl by the hair. And Avery, in desperation, punches Chadron from behind. And Chadron falls on the girl and apparently breaks her hip or breaks her leg or something. Something breaks. And Avery is horrified that he is at least partially responsible for this. And then Chadron gets up, laughs it off as Avery's trying to comfort the girl who's in pain. And uh, Chadron knocks him across the room, then grabs the girl who's screaming, please help, while Chadron's talking in his nonsense language. And, uh, and then he points at Avery and says, uh, says a nonsense word. And then Avery is rushing at Chadron while Chadron appears to crush the girl's head. So you might have noticed these orange boxes popping up along the way. And those orange boxes contain the words, of Cedric the Tailor, who is the person to whom Avery is recounting this story of his early years. And these are the things that Cedric has to say uh, during Avery's recollection. People wrongfully assume that we have it all under control. The good guys are always expected to win. I've got two in brackets there because that's actually left out of the comic and uh, Eric July has uh, acknowledged that that was a typo that unfortunately made it into the final proof. This is our mind projecting our irrational desires onto reality. We know this can't possibly be the case. This is why so many of us are unprepared. Even the heroes trick themselves into believing this. And this is why so many of them have no idea how to respond when evil wins. And Avery replies, It wasn't the first fight I'd lost, but I'd never felt so helpless. It outmatched me in every way, and it couldn't be reasoned with. Couldn't be reasoned with. I mean, it's not like Avery had any opportunity to try. I mean, you know, when when the when the creature you're fighting does not speak the same language as you, the, you don't have much to recourse to. But uh, there's also the fact that Avery, throughout the fight, didn't really try to reason with Chadron. Didn't try using sign language or anything like that. Uh, just basically, when when uh, talking was shown not to be. Uh, possible, then he just basically hit the guy as much as he could. Well, okay. I mean, that's it's not exactly saying that Chadron couldn't be reasoned with so much as Avery didn't try. Getting back to the text. So you quit? Just because you want to pretend it away does not mean that evil isn't present. I know, Cedric. And that makes it worse. More than anybody, you know what happens when heroes fall short. Had you not been there, there'd be two families getting that dreadful visit. You gave up because you couldn't save that girl, but you failed to save more with your inaction. It'll take me some days to get it ready. Eh, nope. Stop using pronouns when you need to use the noun. This is something I get on Eric July about on the regular. Uh, we don't actually know what it is he's talking about. If you are a reader of ISOM number two who has not read ISOM number one, which is something that is entirely possible. I covered that in my video about speaking of, of a bad segue on the opening sequence. Uh, if you are like a Gooding fan and you're coming back to ISOM number two because ISOM number two is the comic where Gooding's introduced, you don't know anything that happened in ISOM number one. So you don't know 
who Cedric is. You don't know who uh, you don't know why Avery has come to visit Cedric, which is to get the ISOM suit back. And why should you be expected to know all that? This is something that you've got to take into account when you are presenting the reader who may not have read your previous books with the text. You have to give in the text enough information for the reader to actually pick up on it. I mean, there's just there's just no way that the reader is going to know what it means. So this should say, it'll take me some days to get the suit ready. Moreover, in this particular establishing shot of Cedric's office, this is where we should have gotten some initial introductory text as to where we are and who we're dealing with in the first place. We should have been told that this is Taylorsville, which is Cedric's shop, and Cedric Taylor is the hero suit designer. So this kind of introductory material is necessary for any reader who is just coming into ISOM number two, not having read ISOM number one. Now getting back to the text. In the meantime, please think about if you really want to do this. I'm not your father but that suit has my imprint on it. It's reasonable that there are certain expectations. These are my conditions. The next time I see you, it better only be for more upgrades. No more quitting. Deal. And then Avery drives home and we are treated to four panels of absolute blankness because, you know, just because he's talked about his, uh, his uh, incident that made him quit for the first time in probably years, that doesn't mean that, you know, he has any thoughts that would be worth communicating to the reader or anything like that. Nah, let's just have four panels of him driving back home. Oh, gosh. Now, I have to say that when you look back at Cedric's argument, it is a pretty decent argument to start from, because Avery's... Um, Avery's situation is one in which the bad guys win. And what Cedric is basically saying is that we are trained by our culture and we are trained by our, our primary assumptions that the good guys are the ones who should always win and the bad guys are the ones who should always lose. If we look back at history, you know, you look at the Revolutionary War and you think, ah, the, good, the Americans, the good guys won. And then you look at the... Uh, uh, the Vietnam War, well, no, that, that, well, that's not a good example at all. <laughs> uh, you look at World War I, let's go for the big ones. You look at World War I, you look at World War II, and you think, oh, the good guys won, the good guys won. And then you run into these situations, and maybe the Vietnam War would be a good example of this one, where the good guys don't win. And, uh, and, and we don't know how to handle that. We don't know how to handle it in, in, in the case where evil wins. And this is something that goes back into human history all the way back to, like, the Bible and stuff. You've got whole psalms that are dedicated in the Old Testament to the fact that bad guys sometimes prosper and good guys sometimes fall on hard times. And why is that? How is that fair? In a world governed by a good God, how is it that the good suffer and the evil rejoice? You know, and, and it's all uh, the Bible tries to put it in terms of divine providence. And when you get to the New Testament— you're given like the ultimate example of somebody who does nothing wrong his entire life, and then uh, instead of receiving rewards and accolades, gets a criminal execution of the most horrible and painful and shameful kind that anybody could have in those days. So it's like, you know, when, when you know that this is a world where bad things can happen to good people and innocent people, how do you deal with that? And that is kind of the central confrontation that uh, Avery is encountering here. However, when Avery is told this by Cedric, he kind of brushes that aside. He's not, he doesn't address Cedric's argument so much as he talks about his feelings of inadequacy. He says, it wasn't the first fight I'd lost, but I'd never felt so helpless. It outmatched me in every way. This is, this is not a moral struggle that Avery is talking about. He's talking about how he feels like he failed to contribute. He feels like there was nothing that he could do. There was no benefit that his presence there had actually con contributed to the fight. And Cedric just kind of bypasses that argument. He doesn't address it in the slightest. He just talks again about evil and saying, you know, you know evil is present in the world. And, 
and then uh, talks about uh, heroes falling short. And only then, in that second paragraph in this panel, does he get into the actual proper response to what Avery said, that there would be two families getting a visit saying your loved one is dead uh, if Avery hadn't been there. I mean, Avery is framing his conflict with Chadron as a failure. He tried to save the girl and he didn't. But there were two people there that he was saving. And one of them actually did make it out. One of them actually did live. And he needs to give himself credit for that. And so there is the core of a psychological argument within all of these like disjointed things that Cedric is saying. And if he could just say them in the right order, that would be a much more compelling argument to turn Avery around. And so what I want to do is I want to get rid of this particular, uh, the dialogue in this particular balloon, uh, because it doesn't really help anything. I mean, it, the problem is not Avery's inability to acknowledge that evil exists. He wants to know how he can contribute in the face of this overwhelming evil. And then what we're going to do is take the dialogue from these three balloons and split it up and rearrange it so that it actually makes a coherent psychological argument. So let's start over. It wasn't the first fight I'd lost, but I'd never felt so helpless. It outmatched me in every way, and it couldn't be reasoned with. Had you not been there, there'd be two families getting that dreadful visit. I know, Cedric. And that makes it worse. You gave up because you couldn't save that girl, but you failed to save more with your inaction. More than anybody, you know what happens when heroes fall short. So, so here, instead of just bypassing Avery's argument, he addresses it head on. He says, look, you need to reframe this. You need to reframe your contribution as a success rather than a failure because you prevented two families from getting a visit saying their loved one had died rather than just one family. And when you realize that, then his giving up is really inexcusable because now, because he hasn't acted, there have been probably more families out in the world who have received that dreadful visit saying your loved one is dead, when he could have stepped in to help. And so Cedric concludes saying, you know what happens when heroes fall short, because he fell short, not in that he uh, couldn't save the girl, but in that he quit after failing to save the girl. He fell, he just compounded his error, or compounded his, what he saw as his failure, instead of actually trying to turn things around from there. Now, the other thing I want to address is the fact that Avery says deal, but I don't know what he's saying deal to, because in the ISOM trailer that we were shown that was released before the premiere of the ISOM comic book, um, Avery is said to be assenting to the no more quitting that Cedric in this particular story says. In the comic book, all Cedric is asking here is, in the meantime, please think about if you really want to do this. And he says that one of the conditions is no more quitting. So when Avery says deal, is he actually saying deal to the no more quitting? Or is he saying it to the, do you, or to, to, is he agreeing to, re to really think about it? Is he agreeing to think about whether he wants to come back? Or is he agreeing to the no more quitting aspect? It's totally ambiguous here, and the ambiguity is partly the result of the fact of the ISOM trailer, in which he seems to be assenting to the no more quitting condition. Um, it would be great if we had some like expository text in the captions here so that we could hear Avery's thoughts and maybe get some clarification, but gosh, that just would have required some work, wouldn't it? Okay, but I really want to point out the fact that something is wrong here in Avery's story, and I wonder if it's something that any of you have picked up on so far. When you look at how Avery concludes his story, he concludes it with him running toward Shadron, who is holding the girl's head in his hand, and that's it. We stop there. But what happens after this? I mean, this is not actually the end of the fight. It can't be. Because for it to be the fight, the end of the fight, there's certain things that possibly have to happen. What happened after the final moment that uh, Avery recollects? It's got to be one of these things. Either Shadron ran away, or Avery ran away, 
or Avery and Chadron fought some more, and then either Chadron ran away or Avery ran away. Avery defeated Chadron, or Chadron defeated Avery. I mean, one of these things had to have happened after that final scene. Because the story didn't just stop in that final moment. We need to know what happened after that. And that makes me wonder, what is Avery hiding? Because he could have told Cedric what was going on, but he didn't. What is he holding back? Now, it's probably not that Chadron ran away, because that was something that I don't think Avery would have had any problem telling Cedric. It couldn't be that Avery had defeated Chadron, because the whole idea is that Chadron was just too much for Avery to handle. Now, Avery running away, um, that... He, it could be, but at the same time, that wouldn't really be, considering how overpowering Chadron is, Avery's running away when there was nobody left to save and just saving himself instead, that could have been looked at as a strategic withdrawal. And so I don't think there would have been this, you know, compulsion to quit over a strategic withdrawal. So the only thing that we really got left is that Chadron defeated Avery, and we're not shown that. Why are we not shown that? And I'd like to believe it's because Shadron defeated Avery and then did something so completely effed up that Avery quit being Isom. So if I were the editor and I were getting this story, I would be looking back for clues as to what that effed up thing could have been. And I think it goes back to this scene with Avery where he's basically desperate to save the girl and so he actually accidentally punches Chadron onto the girl which hurts the girl and he's horrified by it and then Chadron after punching him out of the way basically says a couple of weird words and points at him as if you know he's trying to communicate some kind of message to Avery and then we get our final moment but notice that we don't actually see the girl die in this final moment her head is there in his hands, and you, the, the, the implication is that he's crushing her head. But we don't actually see this, and Avery doesn't even really say that. Uh, although he does, you know, he doesn't contradict uh, Cedric when he says that the girl died. So, what can we do with this information? Well, I would make, if I were the editor on ISOM number two, I would make three revisions. The first revision that I would make is that Chadron would speak English. Because one of the big problems with Chadron not speaking English, like I've said before, is that we don't know if the conflict between Avery and Chadron is really this because of malevolence or it's an inability to communicate and therefore Chadron is just acting according to whatever customs and values may be appropriate to his particular species. So instead of that, let's change it so that we can clearly see that Chadron is one messed up cookie and who is kind of like, you know, totally malevolent in this case. So like in this scene where Avery or where Chadron is shrugging off the punch that uh, Avery just gave him and is looking at the kids and then looks at Avery and says, um, um, balor. let's have him say instead, race you. And then he takes off after the kids. You know, he's just made, he's just challenged Avery to, 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 to a race for sport. You know, now he's sporting with the kids' lives. So that that gives us reason to hate the guy right now because he's we, we now know that he's just doing this for grins. So he grabs the girl. Avery punches Chadron. Chadron falls on the girl, breaks something of the girls, and uh, Avery is horrified. Chadron punches Avery across the room. And then Chadron says, Olamang, while grabbing the girl, and then points at Avery and says, Shedre. But we don't understand that, so let's make it something that we can understand. Let's have him, when he grabs the girl, say, Fun idea. And then Chadron points at him and says, I'll use you. And then Avery runs at the girl who is held in the grasp of Chadron, and then things cut back to the tailor shop from there. Now, the second revision is, I would have Cedric call out Avery on his BS. Avery is obviously hiding something, and Cedric knows it. So let's have Avery, or let's have Cedric expose this. It wasn't the first fight I'd lost, but I never felt so helpless. 
It outmatched me in every way, and it couldn't be reasoned with. Avery, you've remarked that I have excellent recall, and I recall the day you gave back your suit. Meaning? It was drenched in blood. Now, you don't owe me the truth, so I won't ask you for it. However, before you put the suit on again, whether for one last hurrah or in a new commitment, I beg you, at least review the truth within your own mind and lay it to rest, lest it bear its teeth and bite you when you need focus. Whatever you did, or whatever was done to you, these are things past. Now, I borrowed these next couple of lines from the trailer. Too many people let the past determine who they are. True greatness is determined by how one deals with the present. So let go of the past that you may deal with the here and now. If you ever do want to talk, I'm here. The suit will be ready in a few days. I expect a man who is ready to wear it to pick it up. Deal. And then, instead of being treated to four panels of frickin' silence on the way back from, uh, from the tailors to the ranch, let's have Avery actually think about some stuff and tell us what he's thinking. Cedric's a hell of a guy. I haven't been called out like that in a long time. I don't know if I can do what he asks, though. I get chills thinking about it. I'm not the introspective type. I built this ranch to get away from my thoughts as much as from my old life. Maybe Cedric is right. Maybe it's time to stop running. That's Sam's truck. He's here pretty early. Okay. Third revision. After the call from Altona, the truth comes out. So Avery gets a call later from Altona after he's gone home to rest, and she, he finds out, Darren showed up to my job. What? It's Lincoln, all right. Founder of Projectus. I know that was tough to hear, but I want you to know that your sister and niece are safe. We dealt with Darren. All right. I think it is best that you join us so that we can protect you and devise a plan of action. He hung up. And then we get a few quiet panels of Avery thinking and thinking and getting a headache thinking and just get, getting steadily more angry and then finally exploding. I'm going to kill him, meaning Darren, of course. Now, what if we were to rewind and Avery were to get the phone call and instead of four silent panels, we could actually get thoughts of Avery's that tied back to the dilemma, the original dilemma that he had. What if Darren's actions here have impacted him the same way that Chadron's actions impacted him in the past, forcing him to make the connection, forcing him to reveal what it was that Chadron did uh, all those years ago that made Avery quit? It's happening again. And just like that, the dam of memory breaks. I'm back in that center, fighting Chadron again. He's got the girl by the head, and I'm rushing him like a desperate fool, and my mind's screaming, I'm too late! But she's still alive. Her screams are muffled by his fist. He was luring me in. In one quick motion, he dropped the girl and bent down, and before I knew it, he had a hand around my ankle and yanked me into the air. Then he started beating that poor girl to death. With me. Again and again, he brought me down on that girl until she was paced. Used me like a club on her till I was knocked out. He'd gotten the idea when I'd accidentally punched him onto her. And now Darren has done what Chadron did, flipped the script right back on me. I hit Darren where he works and made him hurt. So he hit Altona where she works and made her hurt. Which brings me back to the same damn question that made me quit all those years ago when I couldn't answer it. What damn good does it do to be a hero and inspire people when you inspire the evil people just as much as you inspire the decent? And then he lets out a primal scream because he's frustrated and still doesn't know the answer. And there you have it. Let's fix ISOM number two, flop psychology. I hope you enjoyed the ride and uh, I hope you will subscribe so that you catch up with me on the next ISOM number two video which may not come out for a while. I actually uh, didn't think I was going to do this one that quickly, but I really wanted to bang it out and get it out of my head before I read any further in the book, And because uh, I've got some things I need to take care of 
it might be a little while before I come out with the next video. So it's very important that if you haven't already hit the subscribe button that you do so that you will get a notification when I come out with the next video in this series or with any other video that uh, I might choose to come out with in the meantime. So thank you all for being along for the ride so far. I've looked at my view totals, and my goodness, 2,500 views are almost, I'm almost to 2,500 views collectively on all of my uh, Let's Fix ISOM number two videos. I'm very happy about that. Uh, I am uh, closing in uh, slowly but surely on that uh, last monetization threshold of 4,000 watch hours. I'm hoping that uh, ISOM number two will get me there eventually. Um, but if not, there's always more stuff to come. I'm looking at uh, Cyberfrog Blood Honey as something that I will review in the, Lex, in the uh, Let's Fix style in the future. And uh, I'm also looking at other creators' properties. I'm uh, giving a special eye to Andy Smith's Cordrath The Reckoning and uh, also to Rini Strachowski's Fiendish. So uh, those might be on the docket at some point in the future. And I do have some other previews lined up that I would like to address at some point in time. Um, it's just a matter of when I can get around to all this stuff. And plus, we've still got about, oh, I want to say 70 more pages of ISOM number two to go. So uh, we will see what we can see uh, as we progress through that. So thank you once again for watching. I, I am Mike Partika, and uh, please do subscribe if you haven't already, and I will talk to you later.